Amen and amen. Let's again thank Mark and the gang up here. Appreciate it very, very much, all the ministry that you've done. Hey, um, how many of you have had the great privilege of teaching a young person how to drive a car? <laughs> it's, a, it's a unique privilege, isn't it? That responsibility fell to me in our family. My oldest uh, son got his permit, did a little driver's training. We went over. Most people in Escondido, just a little aside, learn how to drive in our church parking lot. That's why there's all kinds of damage, light poles and everything around, but I digress. Uh, so I, I took my son out, tried to teach him how to drive. We decided the big, big day was going to come, and we were going to go out to breakfast together. So jumped in my car. He's driving. And he's doing quite good getting there. We get to the restaurant, no problem. We sit down and have a wonderful, wonderful breakfast together. Time comes to leave. So he hops in the driver's seat and uh, starts the car up. And as he's pulling out of the parking lot, he doesn't quite negotiate the turning of the wheel and the accelerator and kind of letting it go, you know? And so what ends up happening is he keeps that wheel turn and his foot on the accelerator. We end up on the sidewalk. <laughs> There's two wheels on the sidewalk and two wheels are on the road. And he finally straightens the thing out. But he, he's just so shocked that we're on the sidewalk, he d forgets to take his foot off the accelerator. And to make matters worse, about 50 yards ahead, there's a telephone pole. So now I'm, I'm the mature parent at this point in time. I'm the instructor. And so I'm using my calm voice. Please stop. <laughs> how, how did you think that worked? <laughs> nothing. Nothing at all. So I'm screaming, stop. He just doesn't stop. So I reach over and I grab the wheel. I yank it this way. We come off the sidewalk. He finally pulls his foot off the accelerator. And he wants to keep driving home. <laughs> we had quite a discussion about that, as you might imagine. But I learned a very important lesson. As soon as my heart got out of my throat, I, I learned a very important lesson. And the lesson is simply this. You have to be properly prepared before you take on a difficult responsibility like driving. And that's what I try to teach my kids. Listen, this is, this is a responsibility. A car is a weapon. More people get killed in car accidents than they do with guns every year. And so you, you've got you to spend some more time getting prepared if you're going to really uh, uh, take advantage of this opportunity and not end up, end up dead. Now, what in the world does all of that have to do with the Bible? Well, it's simply this. It's the exact same lesson that we're going to learn in our, our study tonight. You've got to be prepared. So let's talk about it, all right? You have a Bible with you, some kind of a Bible, a text of some kind on your phone, a tablet, something. Everybody have an outline? If you don't have an outline, raise uh, your hand, and one of our lovely assistants will come on down. We need a few down front here, somebody. Thank you. If you bring just a few down. All right. First Kings chapter 17, getting prepared to stand alone. Just a quick review. If you need one, raise up a hand. A couple down in front here. Just a quick review. Last night we started in First Kings chapter 17, verse 1. We met about, uh, uh, learned about uh, God's prophet, a, a man by the name of Elijah. Elijah. Elijah's name means Yahweh is my God. And God sends Elijah, his prophet, to confront a very wicked king. That king's name was Ahab. Ahab married a very wicked woman by the name of Jezebel. And they get married. And they come over into the northern kingdom of Israel. Ahab builds her a bunch of temples to these pagan gods. And before you know it, the whole nation of Israel has been spiritually corrupted. They have tossed the worship of Yahweh out the window, the God of Israel. They no thanks. And they've all gone the way of the worship of Baal. Well, the, uh, the Almighty was uh, ticked. And so he sends his prophet Elijah. Elijah's name means 
Yahweh is my God? I'll probably ask you that question a few more times tonight. Uh, he sends Elijah to Ahab and says, uh, no more rain. For how long? Three years. Three years. No rain. You imagine drought conditions in an agricultural setting. The, <clears throat> the nation of Israel on uh, longitude, latitude, and all of that stuff, almost identical to, to California. The northern part of Israel is real wet and trees, lush. The middle section is a whole breadbasket. Down south, Jerusalem, it's all desert. It's northern California, central California, and the deserts of Los Angeles and San Diego County. And so we get it, we've been in this drought for a long time. And you just imagine no rain three years. So it's just part of the judgment of the, of the Almighty here. And uh, this announcement's made. Let's pick up our text. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. This will launch us into our study tonight. Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord the God of Israel lives before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. So we're not talking days, we're talk not talking weeks, months, we're talking years, all right? And so last night we talked about the qualities that God was looking for in the woman or man, the, the girl or boy, the grandma or grandpa, qualities that, it, that uh, the Almighty is looking for in uh, somebody who's going to take a stand for him. Of what's right in his eyes more than anything else. And so we highlighted those qualities. Well, after Elijah has this conversation with Ahab, uh, Elijah immediately takes off. And this is where we pick up our text, starting in verse 2. The word of the Lord came to him. So Elijah had been faithful to deliver the word, so God gave him another word. This time it's about the prophet himself. Verse 3. Go away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. It shall be that you will drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to provide for you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and lived by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the mornings, and bread and meat in the evenings, and he would drink from the brook. So he moves now from northern Israel, Okay, the, the, the kingdom of Israel in the north. He goes across the Jordan River into what is today modern-day Jordan. And he's heading to a, a place called Cherith. Uh, the New American Standard that I use translates he's headed towards a brook. The New International would translate it as a ravine. And I think that's probably more accurate. The Hebrew word literally is a cutting that's what cherith means. It's, it's a cutting. So think of a valley that's been chiseled out, a gorge, if you will. That's where Elijah's heading. And God is sending them there for a reason. Uh, the, the name cherith in many ways becomes a symbolic name for what God's got to do in Elijah. He's going to isolate him because there's a hundred other prophets out there somewhere, and God doesn't send Elijah there. He wants Elijah by himself, and he puts him into this cutting to isolate him so that he can then begin to cut away some of the areas of Elijah's life that's keeping him from being the man that God needs him to be. The ravine of Cherith here. And uh, whether it was to protect Elijah from Ahab, I think it's more just about this whole principle of preparation. So let me give you the big idea of what we're going to be talking about tonight. Here's the main point. There's a great difference, significant difference, between being a spokesperson for God and being a godly spokesperson. A lot of people in this world who say that they speak for God. 
And you can hear them, you listen to them on podcasts, internet, whatever. And a lot of people who claim to have the voice of God and be able to communicate it. It's very, very different being that and actually being a godly woman or a godly man who speaks for the Lord. And before we ever go anywhere in terms of speaking to others about the Almighty, we first have to let the Almighty speak to us. See, there's a difference between being a mouthpiece and having your heart transformed and changed. To use Ryan's marvelous explanation this morning, marvelous explanation this morning of that. There's a lot of people that can spout water, but only God can transform and turn that water to wine before it really comes out as something beautiful and something good and something joyful, say. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, God is going to send Elijah to experience a little bit of spiritual surgery in his life so that he can be used to the Lord. Now, why does he need it? Because he's Elijah the Tishbite. And what's so special about that? Nothing. He's just an average person. Just like me, just like you, just like us. And uh, Elijah just need, needs to learn. Even just a normal, everyday person who wants to make a stand for the Almighty in a culture that we're all admitting it's kind of gotten way off base. We want to do that. We're going to have to learn some really important lessons. We're going to have to go to the ravine Cherith and kind of let God do a little bit of that surgery on us here. And so there's always going to be some special training. There's always going to be some special preparation that God takes us through in order to be godly women and men who stand up for him. And in our text, just a few minutes that I'm going to take with you here, there are four key lessons. You want to be a godly spokesperson for the Lord, say amen. 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 Four lessons that you and I and we have to learn. Elijah had to learn them. And they're going to be real simple. They're going to be straightforward. They're going to come right out of the scriptures. But it's going to be very, very challenging. So if you want to be a godly spokesperson, lesson number one. This is what Elijah had to learn. First, he had to practice obedience to God's unexplained directives. All right. Verse 3 again. God says to Elijah, go away from here. That was a little surprising to me. I would have thought that God wanted him to stay right close to Ahab so he could be a burr in Ahab's saddle. That he could be continually reminding him, hey, you're off base here. Hey, don't do that. That's stupid. Don't, you don't want to go. Do you stop. What? He sends the prophet in a completely different direction. Uh, go away from here. And he doesn't explain it. He just says, get out of town. And Elijah had to come to that place where as soon as God said, jump, he said, what? Oh, uh hi. -huh. I'm ready to go. You don't have to explain everything to me. Easy to talk about. Hard to do. But until we learn about obedience, we're going to end up this morning, we're going to end up forfeiting blessings. Because when you and I and we, when we obey the Lord, we put ourselves in the place where God can bless us most profoundly. And so for some explained, unexplained reason, he says, yeah, okay, go. And we get that. I, I, has God ever told you to do something without explaining? It, it happens. You know. We don't get the whole picture. We just get a piece of the picture. My son, he didn't have the whole picture about driving. Thought he did. But he just had a small little piece. 
And so we have to get to these places, people, you know, they come to, that have been hurt profoundly. Well, you need to forgive her. What? I, 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 you need to forgive her. That's what it says. Just like, do you know what she did to me? I, I, I can't explain it all to you. And finances are tight, and you want me to keep giving to the church? I, I, I mean, we don't always get all the explanations on everything. But this is where it just comes back. You want to be a godly spokesperson, you've got to learn. Lord, I'll obey you, even though you don't tell me everything about the picture. I like this Dr. Howard Hendricks from Dallas Seminary. He's a profoundly influential man. Uh, I constantly attempt to impress God with how much I know. He constantly seeks to impress me with how little I have obeyed. Because <laughs> that's what it kind of comes back down to, where the rubber meets the road in our Christian lives here. So when you don't have the whole picture of what God is doing, and what God is saying, all I can encourage you to do, I think it's a biblical principle, is just do the next right thing. God may not tell you 12 steps down the road, but more often than not, he shows you the next step. And that's what the walk of faith is. You take a step, take a step, God says, keep going. I have no idea what's down there. And I don't know what God is calling you to do. But all I know is this, is you're not going to get every explanation for why God is telling you to do something. Because he just wants you to trust him and not lean on your own understanding. doesn't mean that we don't use our understanding. It just means I don't put my full weight on what I can understand. Because I'm not going to understand everything. You know, why a son dies, Howard. I, you, you just have no explanation. All that happens, it's just enruptured in your heart and the pain and the anguish of it all. And God just says, okay, you're going to have to trust me. And that's the way life is. And if we're going to be godly, spokeswomen and spokesmen, it's a critical principle. No matter what. Lord, when you say this is what I ought to do, guys, I'll make the application. It says in the text that you are to love your wife as Christ loved the church. That means you sacrifice for her. That means you are number two. And she's number one. I don't know how it works for you. But all I know is I just have to take some steps in that direction, put it into practice. You know, this is where all the commands come in. Honor your father and your mother. First command with the promise. And your folks get older and it gets harder and harder and harder. And I don't know. I don't know where it's going. Um, what is God directing you to do? You, you hear anything? That's why we're here week 10, Cannon Beach. Secondly, you're going to have to spend some time alone listening to God's voice. Verse 3. Go away from here, turn eastward, and hide yourself. Uh, that's, it's an intentional concealment. Go and hide. Be absent on purpose. Get away from here. 
And I don't want, as I mentioned, I don't want you with those hundred other prophets. I just need to talk to you. And I want to talk to you about the next right thing that I want you to do for me. And I think that's part of the reason why the text says that Elijah went eastward. Because you keep going over the Jordan and you head east, you're heading directly into the desert. Okay. And the Hebrew word, interesting, the Hebrew word from desert comes from a root word meaning to speak. That's what the desert is. The desert is a place where God speaks. Moses, the great man of the desert, God spoke to him. David, out in the wilderness, Elijah, by himself, because it's there when we're alone that we kind of can put away all of the distractions and we can tune in. God, what are you saying to me? Because this, this world is chaotic. It's confusing. And all I want to do is just sit and walk with you. And it's only when we get to that place where we're actually hearing from the Almighty that we can then become his godly spokesperson. So the principle is pretty straightforward. Speaking powerfully in public demands listening carefully in private. So let me give you the challenge using this little object lesson. If you're not familiar, I'm sorry if you don't connect to this, but this is a solenoid. Are you familiar? Automatic sprinkler valves, you know, the whole thing. If you don't want to go out and turn on your sprinklers, you put in an automatic sprinkler valve. Every sprinkler valve has a solenoid on it. And what you do is you take these wires and you hook one of them up to a power source, the other up to a timer. The power short source comes in, hooks in, this thing goes, opens up, water flows. At a certain time, then it stops. Have I lost you all or you know what a solenoid is? Okay. Here's the key. In any kind of electrical work, you take these two wires and you have to twist them in order to keep them together, what do you put on it? A little electrical cap here. And you put this thing on. And you twist it on, right? And it really connects those things together. Now, you leave it like that. It's supposed to stay like that forever. Have any of you ever had an electrical cap come loose? Anybody? How in the world do they get loose? Pressure, time, electrical shock, every those kinds of things, just kind of. And if you don't go out there and tighten that cap, what happens? That cap kind of comes unscrewed, and before long, those wires get disconnected, and the power source no longer tells the thing what to do and when to do it. And if you connect, why are we here, Cannon Beach, week 10? Listen. I know you all love the Lord or else you wouldn't be here. This is a Christian camp, okay? <laughs> right? you, you all love the Lord. The problem with our lives sometimes is we've got so much going on that the cap of our spiritual life comes loose. And so we come to places like this to just go out and talk to the Almighty and to tighten that cap up. If you love the Lord, say amen. amen. Just tighten that cap up and, and take some time to listen to his voice. Is there anything going on in that heart of yours that might lead you astray? Kind of want to go there. I want to be a godly spokesperson. I want to do this right. And so that's why we're here. We just want to tighten this down. And that's what he's going to do with Elijah here. Going to tighten it down with Elijah. Because he obviously loves the Lord. He's made this great comment to, to Ahab. So, I don't know, will you please take some time 
tomorrow? Just take a deep breath. Lord, how are we doing? Because we've got to learn to practice obedience. We've got to learn to listen quietly. We have to trust steadfastly in God's faithfulness. That's what it's going to take. Hide yourself by the brook Cherith, okay? So you're going to go out by yourself. You're going to go out into this gorge in this ravine. And now all the practical questions start. Well, what am I going to do out there? What am I going to wear? Where am I going to live? What am I going to eat out there? And the question is, uh, is food just going to drop out of the sky? And what's God's answer? Kind of. Verse 4. It shall be that you'll drink by the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to provide for you there. So, Elijah, you take this step, and you head out to the desert. I promise you, when you get there, I will provide for you. I'll take care of you, if you will. I'll feed you. I'll clothe you. I'll provide for you. I'll protect you. You go where God calls you to go. That's his commitment to you. Really important that you get that. My God shall supply, what's it say? Some? Few? Kind of? All your needs. I'll take care of you. That's why it's critically important. We make the commitment of obedience, then we have to listen. Because it's only as I'm listening and I'm taking those steps in the right directions to this promise, I'll take care of you. Hold. The problem that most of us have, even as we take those steps of faith, is that our expectations of what and how God provides sometimes get mixed up. And that's why in our text it says that the food is going to be delivered by what? What kind of a bird? Ravens. ravens. Important. Important to note, ravens were unclean animals. Why? Because they eat dead things, rotten things, carrion. So Who's going to be bringing the food to Elijah? What's that food going to look like? Come on, you put yourself in this. What's that food going to look like? Is it chewed up already? Clawed up already? And I'm just, and, and the point that I'm trying to make with you here is these expectations that you and I often have is that when we hear this promise that God is going to provide all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus, that means filet mignon. Are you with me? But more often than not, it's turkey. Sometimes it's bologna. Sometimes it's spam. But God, I need transportation. So, of course, if God sent it, he, God's going to meet all my needs. It's going to be a BMW. It's going to be a Porsche, whatever it is. Be put up there. And those expectations are completely out of whack. Because sometimes God is going to say to you, hey, you know what I've provided for you? I've provided a friend who has a car. Or, as a matter of fact, I've provided a bicycle. Or as a matter of fact, I gave you two healthy legs, so get walking. Because in all of those, God has provided. It just doesn't always meet our expectations. And I think that's one of the lessons that Elijah has to learn here. And what happens is if God doesn't provide filet mignon, we question his faithfulness. 
And he's not been unfaithful. It's just that our expectations are completely out of whack here. And so we study these texts to bring us back to that place here to understand that our God is faithful. He just doesn't always provide in the way or to the extent that we think that he should. And it's really our problem here. So, I don't know. Are you trusting in the Lord? Has he given you less? And if you question his faithfulness at all, so that's what you kind of, we're here, okay. I'll take the next step. I hear what you're telling me to do. And I'm going to trust that you're going to provide for me. Elijah has to learn all those lessons. So do I, so do you. Verse 5, so he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and lived by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. Uh, What did he do in the ravine? What do you do in a a ravine? You're all by yourself. You throw throw rocks? I mean, what what do you do? Try and see if you can hit the cave over there from left-handed, right-handed. I don't know how how you guys... What did he have to do? He had to wait. I hate to wait. I hate waiting. What you, would you have done on that first morning? Because uh, who's, who's bringing the food? A raven. What's that food going to look like? You have no idea because it's morning number one. You know? And so you just have to wait. Ravens, verse 6, brought him bread and meat in the morning, bread and meat in the evening, and he would drink from the brook. Talk about the good life. He's got meat, he's got bread, and he's got water. But every day he had to wait. Had to wait for the ravens to show up in the morning. And he had to wait in the evening. And he was wondering whether it would be an early bird special ever coming up, you know. But every day he had to go back to the promise and the plan of the Almighty to sit quietly at the brook until God's provision showed up. And how long was he in the the ravine? One year. One year. He's waiting every single day for food. God, you're going to come through? God, you're going to provide? God, is this it? I mean, do I have to burn this thing to get every germ off of it? What? Trusting God every day. Every single day. Every meal was a new exercise in faith. And he had to keep on believing and keep on believing and keep on believing that his obedience would pay off, that listening would guide him down the right path, that God would be faithful, and all that he needed to do was just keep waiting, and the Almighty would show up. So, anybody connect with this at all? Because this is the journey that we're all taking together. There's a great difference between being a spokesperson and being a godly spokesperson. And waiting on the Almighty's timetable, whew, it's hard to do. But when we do, 
So is the Lord directing any of you to do something really kind of different? And you're terrified to do it? Just wondering, how's this all going to work? Well, the, the whole message is that you're going to have to learn to trust me. That's what Elijah's got to do. Every godly spokesperson has to do. So, all right. Let me just tell you one quick story, okay? Member of our church family, successful business uh, person in our family, went through a really hard time back 2001. Engineering firm, uh, lost his business, was horribly in debt. And right before it, he and his wife went out to eastern part of Escondido out towards the area known as Ramona out there, bought a big piece of property. And they were fixing it up out there and great plans for it and then lost everything. And uh, being so significantly in debt, he had no idea how he was going to pay for anything, let alone buy food for his family. I mean, he was broke. And so they decided to try and use their time, and they started working on this property. Apparently, it was a property where a lot of people just stored a bunch of junk. And so he decided it was going to be you know, his time to kind of clean the thing up. But every time it rained, little pieces of junk would pop up out of the ground. You know, the ground would settle. And so uh, he was always pulling stuff out of the ground. The other thing that was unique to him was uh, there was a barn on the property, and in the barn was a safe, one of those big combination safes, big, huge thing. And he always wondered. And the people that he bought the property from guaranteed him there was nothing in that safe but they couldn't open it. So he thought, I've got the time. So they and his son hauled that thing into their work area. And he got out a torch and torched off the hinges and then pried that thing because best they lid falls off. Inside, true story, inside is a box. And in the box is three $100 bills. Somebody say praise the Lord, will you? <laughs> praise the Lord. He's, he's got $300. He was hoping for Apple stock. He was hoping for Berkshire Hathaway stock. You know, he's hoping for that kind of stuff. But there's three, so better than a kick in the head. So he said, I, I got to go tell mom about this because we've got money for food for this week. And so he's walking from the barn up to the house and doing what he always does. He looks down on the ground and sees this little piece of wire sticking out of the ground. And he goes down and he starts wiggling it and pulling on it and kicking it and pulling on it. Pops up and it's a little silver trinket made of plastic. And then he looked at it. And you know what it said? Two words on it. All it said was, Trust me. And he realized that the God of the universe who created all things, who is in charge of every mountain, owns the cattle on a thousand hills, said, I may not give you everything that you want, but I promise you I will give you what you need. You just have to. Trust me. And so I told that story to our church family. And a member of our church was touched by it. And so he went out and made 
<laughs> Several thousand of these. And all I added to them was Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 that says, trust in the Lord with and do not So, who's this for tonight? Trust me. That's what he's saying. Trust me. You do the next right thing. I, I'll take care of you. May come in unusual ways. May come in unexpected ways. May come in ways you don't even like. But it's my way, God says to you, me and us, it's my way of shaping you and cutting in the ravine cherith, cutting away some of those things to prepare you to take a stand for me. So make sure that you come up and grab one, will you, if you want one. I think there's 150 of them here. I think that should cover it, but don't take 12 of them, okay? <laughs> but take one, and then if you, if you don't get one, come up and see me, and I'll make sure that you get one, okay? All right, that's it. Let's pray. All right, everybody take a really deep breath, will you? Let's start with have you trusted him? Many of you have. Thank him for the provision of grace. If you haven't trusted him, tell him you're sorry. And if it's in your heart to do, tell him you want to trust him more. He's a father who loves you. He gave his son for you. He'll watch over you. He's a good father. Ask for his help. Anybody tonight, if you haven't yet made your decision for Jesus, Jesus, save me. It's a good prayer. Anybody tonight? I put my trust in you, Jesus. Got to cut anchor with those good works. You're trying to earn your forgiveness and just trust him. So if you haven't yet made your decision, I would invite you to. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So I hope you will. Our Father, thank you for the gift of your son and we owe you everything, Father. So speak to my sisters and brothers in Christ and speak to me so that we might trust you more. Hear our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.